Well, a warm good morning, or maybe it's a warm good afternoon, or even a warm good evening, depending upon where you are dialing in from the world. If you are intending to find the University of Pennsylvania's Master of Applied Positive Psychology Programs virtual info session, then you are in the right place. We are so glad that you're here. We know that your time is precious, so thank you for giving us a part of your day. We're excited to share a little bit more with you about this program that we know very well and love very much. But we're first going to start with some introductions. My name is Leona Brandwein. I serve as the Associate Director of Education at the Positive Psychology Center here at the University of Pennsylvania. In addition to that role, I also happen to be an alumna of the program. So I've got lots of information, both um, from the experience as a student, but also um, behind the scenes as, the, as an associate director and instructor. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of that with you. I am also joined by a number of colleagues. I'd like to turn over to Laura to introduce herself. Thanks so much, Leona. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Taylor, Project Manager of Education for the Positive Education Team and importantly serving in that role for MAP. Um, delighted to be with you today and also an alumna of the MAP program. So hopefully we will be able to answer all of the questions that you have burning for you today and passing it right along. Nicole. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Stottlemyre, the Operations Coordinator. So I help with new student questions. And once students are enrolled in the program, get them all uh, set up and ready to rock. All right, Aaron, over to you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm Aaron Butchkowski, the Manager of Education at the Positive Psychology Center. Um, I am not an alum, but I've been with the program for 17 years, so I hope I can answer all of your questions. So please uh, feel free to uh, ask away. Thanks for being here. Aaron, I think if there's honorary alum status, you probably have earned it. Um, so I also want to recognize our colleague, Akila Abdul-Rahman, who is with us. She is serving as our producer for today. We would not be able to be hosting this session without her. She's also feeling under the weather. So send some good vibes, Akila's way. Akila, thank you, thank you so much for being here. Okay, we are going to take care of a little bit of housekeeping and then we're going to dive right in. First thing we'd love to do is just talk a little bit about how we will be handling this today and how we will particularly handle questions. So the MAP classroom is quite a collaborative one. And so we're going to mirror some of that today in our experience. You will be using the Q&A feature to ask questions. We explicitly ask that you not use the chat to ask questions. Chat's great for chatting, um, but if you do have a particular question, put it in the Q&A section because that will enable other people in the room to upvote um, uh, questions that are interesting to them so that we understand what things are most important to you. So um, if your question is not answered during the presentation or is going to be answered in the presentation, we may not address it specifically in the Q&A because we'll be handling it verbally during the presentation. I will say that Nicole and Aaron handle so many questions during this session that they often have to move very quickly. So you may just see a simple yes or no um, in response to some of your questions. And so please bear with us as we do that. The final thing that I'll say is we do have an FAQ document that Nicole is going to upload into the chat, which may answer some of the questions that you already have. So if there are some things that are particular on that, you can take a look at that, but that um, Google document will be available to you so that you can take a look at it um, and get some of your burning questions answered. So before we move on with the rest of our agenda, we are curious who in the room is here and where you might be hailing from. So we are going to ask you to put into the chat um, where you're located. If you're in the United States, city and state would be great. If you're outside of the United States, your city and country, just so that we can get an idea of where people are from. Now, I can't see the chat, but my colleagues can. So I'm going to um, hear from my friends um, where folks are hailing from. We've got people coming in from Cincinnati, Ohio, and Denver, um, Blue Ridge Summit, PA, New York, New York, Shanghai, Lansdale, Columbia, South Carolina, Chicago, San Francisco, Valley Forge, Washington, D.C. It's a fascinating group coming in. 
Nice. Well, welcome. And no matter where you are, looks like we've got a large array from the U.S. And hello, Shanghai. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. It's um, good to have you be a part of this session. So speaking of this session, let's talk a little bit more about how we're going to handle today. So you've already handled Q&A, and now this is what our agenda is going to cover today. We're going to um, particularly be spending some time on the program format, because I know that that is where a lot of your questions reside. But first, we're going to start off by just spending a little bit of time talking about positive psychology and what it is, um, because even though it's a very um, exciting field, it's also still a fairly new field in spite of the fact that we are entering our 20th year. So I'm going to go ahead and dive into that before I turn things over to Laura to talk about the MAP program and faculty. Okay, so speaking of faculty, some of you may recognize this gentleman. Of course, this is Martin E.P. Seligman, who most of you will probably have seen his name on publications um, written thusly as M.E.P. Seligman. Around the Positive Psychology Center, he is known as Marty. Um, and of course, in our classroom, he is known as Marty. We are very fortunate to have Marty at the University of Pennsylvania. He is one of the founding fathers of the field of positive psychology. And that goes back during his presidency of the American Psychological Association in 1998. During Marty's presidential address at that time, he was galvanizing the field to shift its focus, not only from curing pathologies, which had been uh, an area of focus and has had wonderful results in being able to address and remediate some of the most common psychopathologies, but Marty, as a practicing clinical psychologist at the time, recognized that often when he would be able to remediate somebody's depression or their anxiety, that what was left was um, somebody without those things, but also without anything that was adding on or contributing to what's north of zero. Um, and so he said, there must be more to life simply than just eliminating what's wrong. A flourishing life is actually the addition of other things. So he and his colleague, Mihai Csikszent Mihai, co-wrote a seminal article that was in American Psychologist in, in the year 2000, wherein they proposed that positive psychology was the study of positive states, like the emotions, positive emotions we experience, positive traits, like the character strengths, which we may bring from different, um, from context to context within our life. And then finally, positive institutions or those organizations and structures around us that create flourishing. And so from that, Marty actually catalyzed a great deal of energy in the field. Not only was attention focused in that area, but also funding for research began to be focused in that area. And that resulted in hundreds of researchers around the world shifting their focus or augmenting their focus to not only look at eliminating what was wrong, but also studying what might go right. So a burgeoning literature resulted from that. Um, if you were to take a look at the Google search engines for concepts like happiness or well-being, um, it almost looks like a hockey stick in the increase in the number of searches, but also the number of references in the literature. In addition to many researchers around the field beginning to focus on what constitutes a flourishing and happy life, there were also many professional applications of that research. When we think about positive psychology, it is inherently interdisciplinary in its application because it is often integrated into any of the spaces where we find human beings. So humans are often engaged in the practice of education or in business or in coaching or in medicine. And so positive psychology gets integrated into those practices. There was, in addition to all of that, a degree program that was started, and that was the Penn Master of Applied Positive Psychology program, which we'll get to a little bit more in a moment. Um, I will say that we were the, the first program, and we're very excited to say that there are many um, MAP programs that have sprung up around the world as this field is really taking hold and garnering a great deal of energy. Finally, I'll also mention that the International Positive Psychology Association was created. That was actually founded by our founding uh, director, um, James Powelski, but I'll get to that gentleman in just a few moments. 
For now, I'll also mention that Positive Psychology at Penn is situated within the Positive Psychology Center. So Marty started the center in 2004, and it really has three pillars behind it. Let's explore those pillars of application research and education very briefly before we dive into education, which is where we're located. Okay, so the Positive Psychology Center um, has first and foremost been focusing on research. As you are aware, there has been um, burgeoning research in the literature, but there have been particular projects that have been launched here at the PPC. Some of those include the World Wellbeing Project, which is leveraging big data through social media in order to understand people's um, states and traits and understandings around well-being. There is the Primals Project that has been headed up by one of our MAP alumni, uh, J.R. Clifton, who has been looking at how people's attitudes and perspectives on the world shape their experience in the world and their well-being. Our director has founded the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project, which looks at and leverages how the humanities can serve and reflect human flourishing. Another MAP alum, uh, David Yaden, uh, was studying transcendence. He has um, since gone on and is now um, overseeing an entire research lab at Johns Hopkins University, looking at the integration of psychedelics and well-being um, and looking at transcendent experience. And then finally, uh, Angela Duckworth and the Character Lab, where she looks at traits that help students to be able to persist in school. So that research then, of course, started to be translated into areas of application. Um, and so some of those areas of application include the work that Karen Breivich and Judy Salzberg have done in looking at applications of resilience in different contexts and domains. Now that started at its greatest scale as master resilience training within the US military. And since then it has exploded in a lot of different areas, both in the corporate sphere, um, in healthcare and other businesses, but also in education, in the Department of Justice, um, in professional sports as well. So basically wherever you can find humans, right? Humans um, need to be resilient as we navigate the world. And those applications are focused on that area. Now, I mentioned that research gets translated into application, but it also gets communicated through education. And here at the Positive Psychology Center, we have a foundation of education that we're quite proud of. That includes our um, foundations, um, course, uh, Coursera courses, or our MOOCs that are offered through Coursera. In addition, we have a fully online undergraduate certificate in applied positive psychology, but perhaps most importantly for all of what you are interested in, we have the Master of Applied Positive Psychology, and we're going to be spending most of our time there. Okay, let's chat a little bit about the MAP program and faculty. So I mentioned that Marty started the PPC back in 2004, and the Master of Applied Positive Psychology program started not too long after that. It started in 2005. And as Marty began to germinate this idea around creating a program to serve practitioners in positive psychology who would then go on to integrate um, the science of human flourishing into the work that they were doing in the world, he knew that he needed a strong director to be able to lead that. So he turned to James Powelski. Um, James was at the time at, the, uh, at Vanderbilt University, um, and James came to Penn to serve as the founding director of the MAP program. I had mentioned earlier that he was also the founding executive director of the International Positive Psychology Association, and he's the founder of the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project here at Penn. So that should give you an idea that James is a pretty busy guy and a pretty active guy, fully engaged in positive psychology and in its application. So when James came to Penn and began to craft um, in collaboration with Marty, this Master of Applied Positive Psychology program, the launch of any new program is a little uncertain, right? Um, there is a question around whether or not there are people that are interested in this enough. It takes some time to be able to get the word out, et cetera. So they figured um, and got some good advice um, from others at the university that said, a new master's program takes some time to get a foothold. So expect your first year that you're gonna have 10 or 12 students and that would be a real resounding success. So the first class of math looked a little bit like this, which would help you to realize that it wasn't just 10 or 12 students. Um, it was a resounding success, but it also was emblematic of how important concepts of flourishing and well-being are to people around the world. We often say 
that you can find positive psychology wherever humans are, because every human wishes to be well. So any corner of the world that you find a human is the right place to be able to apply positive psychology. So the classes are growing and they continue to grow. Um, I'll share this photo with you, which was actually um, from 2015. So it feels like a, a while ago, but this was actually our 10 year celebration of the MAP program um, where our alumni came back to celebrate the experiences that they had, the learning and application that they were engaged in. We're going to be looking forward to actually doing a 20 year celebration in not too long, but we'll save that conversation for another time. Uh, we have a number of our alumni that are reflected here. Since that time, we've had very full classes and our alumni now number over 700 in number, which is an amazing feat to us, especially for me. Uh, when I went to MAP back in 2009, 2010, uh, it was hovering around 120. So there has been a really big change since that time. Okay. Let us transition and let's actually talk about that MAP program. Laura, if you feel ready, I'm going to turn things over to you to talk about MAP's educational design. Thank you so much, Leona. And yes, I would love to just spend a few minutes diving and double clicking down on the educational design. So as you may already know from your research in the MAP program, MAP is intended to provide you with extensive academic preparation. We look at the theories and empirical foundations of positive psychology as we deeply consider the ethical application of that work. It's one calendar year of full-time study that begins each fall. And there's no professional master's degree that um, I'm sorry, this is a professional master's degree that enables scholars or practitioners in areas in which they are expert. So there's no licensure or credentialing as the populations our students work with are by and large non-clinical populations. Our intention is that our students will be applying and helping individuals to flourish, not just in a psychological context, but in any context where you find a human being. Specifically, MAP is not a research master's program. A small percentage of our students elect to do research during their capstone projects as they intend to go on to a PhD, but about 95% of our students are really interested in becoming scholarly practitioners who want to think about how to take positive psychology out into the world. And as such, their capstone project will be focused on areas of application that are personally relevant to them. MAP is structured as a hybrid model that includes a combination of both synchronous on-site classes and asynchronous distance learning between classes. Now to clarify, when we say on-site, we mean synchronous learning, be it on campus or in our virtual classroom. And we value connections. So we will continue the current MAP program format in the beginning of the academic year, 24, 25, which you would potentially be applying for. What does that look like? Well, we alternate from synchronous on-site classes on our Philadelphia campus, that come in person to Philadelphia and in our virtual campus, which takes place in the Zoom classroom. And our distance learning periods will continue between each and every onsite. So don't forget, full-time study is not just the onsites, it's also that asynchronous learning that you have between each and every onsite. The same will be true in the spring semester. So those dates, again, you have the onsites alternating in person on the campus um, in Philadelphia, and then our virtual campus, and again, the distance learning periods right between. So it is considered full-time study, um, and it's something to just really be aware of. We average 20 to 25 hours a week um, for our students and alumni. But the wonderful thing about this hybrid design is that it allows students to continue working full time, which enables application ideas and other things of that sort. It helps people to not stop life, work, family, and other commitments. And it permits full time work, as I said, I want to put a little asterisk there. When we say full time, we mean about 40 hours a week. So if you're a human who is already in the 60 to 80 hour range, that may or may not be wise to take on additional study because, as I just briefly mentioned, we are expecting our MAP students to spend around 20 to 25 hours a week on their work in MAP. Um, and that's primarily due to reading and writing. And so that could vary depending on your particular speeds. Um, students who join MAP typically get to remain domiciled in their own communities and continue to work, which means you don't have to have residents in Philadelphia to be a MAP student. And it allows for students to participate from as far away as Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia. We love the enabling of a diverse community so that we can welcome all the ideas that come from global participation into our classroom. 
It enriches the classroom experience with diverse professional and geographical backgrounds, but it's enhancing not just that educational experience with a rich discussion and variety of perspectives, but also enables us to have a diverse faculty as well. And we get to invite leading faculty from across a variety of institutions because of our format that and our educational design. So what does that look like? Well, we are lucky enough to have rich um, strength in positive psychology here at the University of Pennsylvania. I, you've already seen Marty. You've heard um, Leona mention Angela Duckworth. You may or may not be familiar with Allison Mackey, who is there, um, and she works in neuroscience. James Pawelski is over there um, to the right-hand side of your screen. And in the lower level, we've got uh, Claire Robertson Craft, who is wonderful um, taking over our statistics and research methods course. We've got Judy Salzburg levick and Karen Rivich, um, Positive Psychologies and Individuals. They also help to run the Penn Resilience Program with their incredible work out of the center. And of course, Jared Clifton, who you heard Leona mention with his work in primals. So we have strength and faculty here at Penn, but we also get to invite so many scholars from a variety of institutions and their diverse experience in areas of primary research, such as moral psychology, community psychology, physical activity and exercise, or a variety of other domains enrich your educational experience. Here are a selection of some of the incredible guest lecturers that are broadening and deepening the educational experience. You might notice Barry Schwartz for cognitive bias and decision-making, Jane Dutton and John Paul Stevens for high quality connections and applications and organizations, Jacqueline Matt identity and well-being. Um, we have Shige Oishi in the psychologically rich life, David Cooperwhiter with appreciative inquiry, Barbara Fredrickson's right there in the center with, of course, the broad and built theory of positive emotions. We have John Bloom and, um, and John Height. I'm sorry, Paul Bloom and John Height, my brain this morning, uh, for moral psychology. And of course, Shane Gillum's work in positive psychology, John Rady, physical health and well-being, Michael Baim, mindfulness meditation, and Amy Rosneski in job crafting. So as you can see, a wide variety of applications, a wide variety of research coming into our classroom. And these um, varied domains really help our students to have a plethora of things to choose from for their own application and purposes in their areas of expertise. The courses that you might experience in the 24, 25 year will look very similar to what we have going on this year. Um, so in fall 2023, we had an introduction to positive psychology with our very own Marty Seligman, who yes, is still teaching in MAP. In case you're wondering, it is the highlight of his week. No doubt he loves working with MAP students. Um, we've got our research methods and evaluation course with Claire Robbins and Craft, who you just saw, the foundations of positive psychology with our director, James Powelski, that will help you figure out and build exactly where you want to go for those positive interventions. Um, heads up, he is a philosopher. There's some deep content there. And of course, the perspectives of well-being, which is coordinated by our own instructor, Leo Brandwing, here on this call with a number of guest lectures that you see here, Michael Baim, Jacqueline Mattis, Isaac Prelitinsky, John Rady, Barry Schwartz, and Jean Twingy were all guests in the last year, which is just fantastic. Um, in the spring... Um, you might notice that we have four more wonderful courses and applying positive interventions in institutions is where we have our service learning projects, again, coordinated by Leona Brandwin. Um, She brings in experts across the field to help you broaden your perspective for that application. David Cooper Ryder, Jane Dutton, Chris Futner, John Paul Stevens, and Amy Brzezneski are names for this year. Positive Psychology and in Individuals is taught by Judy salzburg levick She is wonderful. We call her our map maven for many reasons. Um, and she really helps you double click and dive down on what does it look like to do these interventions in a one-on-one -on -one basis? How can you do that ethically? And with support, you get a lot of practice in the course. And then the positive psychology and neuroscience of character is with our neuroscientist, Allison Mackey, who really is able to broaden this conversation on what it looks like across the lifespan to develop um, and use our brains for these types of interventions. She welcomes in folks um, in positive education, including Angela Duckworth, Alejandro Adler, and Jane Gillum. And of course, the Humanities and Human Flourishing course, which um, James Polsky is leading in, in association with his Humanities and Flour Human Flourishing project through the Positive Psychology Center is a wonderful way to expand how we as humans are engaging culturally with all of these topics. Then the summer semester, you might forget about it because we've talked so much about the spring and the fall, but you're still a full-time student in the summer because you will be engaged in your individual capstone project. This individual project 
integrates the student, um, what you have learned across the year, helps to demonstrate that excellence and growth that you have had, and now is diving down on what area and application you particularly want to be interested in learning about. You will have an advisor for the course, um, and it is one way that you will be able to continue to extend your learning and have personal development um, and guide that for your own work. Whew. That is also full-time across the summer semester and brings you to the end of your nine courses in math. We've been talking a while, so I want to check in and just see how are you doing. Um, let's do a quick little pop quiz. Which of these might be true? You can respond in the chat. Is it A, the University of Pennsylvania's MAP program was the first of its kind? B, the founder of positive psychology, Martin Seligman, still teaches a course in MAP? C, one strength of the MAP program is the diversity of its faculty, D, A and C, or E, all of the above. Let's see how well you were paying attention. Oh, there's no fooling any of you. It's already starting to come right in. Yes, indeed, it is E. <laughs> it looks like we have some scholars in the classroom. Wonderful. That's terrific. Okay. Well, I don't know, Laura. They passed that first quiz. Let's see. Let's test them a little bit and see if they can pass another one. That sounds great, Leona. So the term on-site means synchronous learning. On-site formats will alternate between Philadelphia campus, one, three, and five, and virtual campus, two, and four. I can attend these on-sites however I want. All of the 10 on-sites are in, um, of the 10 on-sites, six are in person and four are virtual, A, B, and D. Hmm. Interesting. Do we know the answer to which of these? Are true. This one's a little trickier. It is a little trickier. Do we have any responses in the chat? I'm unable to see. The We're chat. getting there. Yes. So okay. we. So I am excited to say that this again is E. And maybe we didn't make it clear in my um, explanation of onsite, but yes, onsite mid synchronous synchronous learning. And yes, they will alternate between Philadelphia campus and virtual campus with one, three, and five being in person and two and four being virtual. C is maybe where you got some of you tripped up. You have to attend the onsite in the format it was delivered. So you don't get to pick and choose which format you come to the onsites in. That format hybrid delivery that goes back and forth is the expectation for success in our classroom. Um, and therefore, we have a. B and D as the correct answer, um, which is, of course, letter E. Thank you so much for playing. And yes, it is also a teaching tool. So that's great. Um, I think we have one or two more, uh, just one more question. Yes, Leona? One more. Awesome. Which of these are true? Most MAP students continue to work full time while attending MAP. B, you can expect to spend about 25 hours a week on your work in MAP. C, MAP prepares students to apply positive psychology within their domain of expertise, and D is A and C, and E is all of the above. What do we have, Laura? We have some quick triggers and wonderful, yes, it is, again, E. We are not trying to trick you. We are simply trying to ensure that you are getting the right information during the session so that you can make the informed decisions you want to be. Yes, it is E all of the above. Thank you so much for playing um, because I know that's a lot of information that we threw at you in a short amount of time. And let's um, let's continue the conversation. Leona, back to you. Awesome, awesome. Okay, thank you. So one thing I wanted to clarify, um, as Laura had mentioned, um, you know, it may seem a bit restrictive, right? That people are required to attend the onsite in the format that it's offered. Um, remember that MAP is not simply an educational experience, it's also a community. And coming together in community as we learn actually amplifies the learning for all. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we have um, that, um, that back and forth and that requirement to hopefully um, create the best of all worlds, right? Uh, and be able to not only come together, but also give people the flexibility to study from home when they need to. Okay, all right, I'm done with that. Let me chat a little bit about students. So Laura was talking about the experience in the MAP classroom. And you may say, hmm, you know, what is it like to be a student? So we thought that we, that a picture paints a thousand words so that we would share some images. 
of what our MAP classroom looks like so you can see our students enjoying class. Now you'll notice there are plenty of smiles. Um, it is positive psychology. We do try to walk the talk of positive educational environments and we want to ensure um, that people are not only um, engaged in the education um, and thinking critically, but also enjoying the experience together in community. You'll also notice that there are an array of different um, perspectives here. And so we really, um, you'll, you'll see an array of ages, um, an array of races, you'll see an array of um, different ethnic backgrounds, et cetera. Um, so that diversity really helps to contribute to the educational experience. When a physician is talking about um, well-being from the perspective of preventing burnout, right, in their profession, um, and a teacher is also talking about um, the increase in burnout, you can imagine the types of synergies and growth that occur from both of them sharing perspectives from their different fields around what that might look like. Similarly, you could also imagine when we begin to talk about things like positive emotions, right? What do positive emotions tend to look like um, in a Western context versus what they might look like in an Eastern context? There are nuances that go along with that. And so having an array of students um, in our environment really helps to ensure that we are enriching that conversation fully. Um, so you may be thinking about, geez, you know, um, you know, where might I fit in that map classroom? So we'll share a little bit about our demographics. First of all, I'll say we have had an array of ages. Our youngest mapster came to us right out of an accelerated undergraduate um, course of study at the age of 21, while our oldest graduates, that's plural, we've had more than one uh, student who's been in the MAP classroom at the age of 70. The average, however, is a mid-career practitioner, somewhere in their mid-30s. Um, so that's an average, but of course, um, averages are an imaginary number and everybody has some variation um, from that mean. Now, in terms of nationality, we are so pleased that we have had an array of countries that have been represented um, around the world. Um, and you can see that there are um, close to 40 that are here um, that, uh, that are represented um, with our newest ones being um, Armenia, um, Ukraine, um, and then last year, Malaysia. So we're delighted to welcome students from a variety of different contexts. Um, and again, for um, some of those students coming in um, virtually enables them to you know, reduce some of the, the heat and reduce some of the challenge of getting to our classroom in Philadelphia. Okay, I had mentioned a little bit about our professional diversity. So let me speak a little bit further about that. Um, we've had, we welcome um, very explicitly an array of different professional domains in the classroom. Cause I had mentioned, you know, there are strengths to be garnered when you have somebody in medicine, speaking to somebody in education, speaking to somebody from the business world. And so these are just a handful of some of those um, professions that have been represented from the field of medicine and health. You can see an array of different practitioners there. Um, I love the the last one on that list is an orthodontist. Um, he liked to say that um, in addition to fixing people's smiles, he wanted to make sure that they were having authentic smiles uh, and enjoying their lives. And so that was his goal in studying positive psychology. Um, in the education domain, this has been an area that has really, really exploded um, in, the, uh, in Australia, in China, um, in Bhutan, and some other communities around the world, and is growing in the United States as well. But administrators from public, private, and charter schools, and in an array of support positions that um, support the student experience, so that we are creating the dual goal of not only helping students to succeed academically, but to succeed in terms of their life skills and well-being as well. From a business perspective, an array of um, different roles and leaders have been a part of our MAP classroom, from CEOs to people who are working in HR, um, coaches and consultants and others that are affiliated in the business realm. Um, the field of law, we've got uh, quite a, a critical mass, I would say, of MAP alumni um, who are attorneys who have been engaged in that work um, because attorneys, um, it tends to be a, a field that's pretty tough on people and tough on their flourishing. And then finally, um, all sorts of others, right? So um, people from the nonprofit world, people who are in the arts, such as professional actors, musicians, and comedians. We might actually have one of those in our group uh, here today, Laura Taylor. Um, in addition, that we've got um, engineers, um, journalists, and others. So it really is a wide array. I had mentioned the mid-career 
um, professional around uh, mid thirties. Um, and we do welcome some college graduates into our uh, classroom space as well. Typically it's about 25% of or less of folks who come into our classroom um, who are recent college graduates. Um, and some of them are actually interested in taking it almost like a pre-professional training before they go on to their next um, experience. One example of that, we had one alumna who came in um, and took MAP as her pre-professional year before she went to medical school um, and began to apply positive psychology in that context. So these are a handful of other um, images from our classroom. I'm actually realizing as I look at the one in the upper left that that is um, from my map year. So I see a, a number of my classmates in there. Um, over on the right, you can see we like to have some fun. Uh, I don't, I don't want to blow any surprises there. But the fun also transcends. You might think, well, what fun could be possibly be had in Zoom? Um, the fun continues. So this was actually um, a little surprise that our map 16 year um, had um, popped on us. Um, they were, um, they had a, um, oh gosh, I think that they had declared that their mascot was the orange and that they called themselves um, the orange class. So they surprised us one day by showing up in class with all of their orange um, crush um, t-shirts. They also love to surprise us. This is um, one time where they um, provided us with um, just a, a warm um, array of appreciation. Um, so there are lots of ways that we come together in the classroom and enjoy our company and build community with each other, both in that virtual format and in a face-to-face -face format. As you can see um, down in the lower left, we've got um, some of our folks who were presenting uh, in class uh, in the upper right as well, um, challenging ideas, um, garnering different perspectives. So we're really proud of the array of people that come into our classroom and the types of experiences they have. But students do not stay in our classroom forever. Hopefully, they graduate. In fact, we have a very high graduation rate. And so the question you may have is, what about the alumni of the MAP program? What are they like? And what can I do with my MAP degree? That is an excellent question. So our MAP Alumni Association, as I had mentioned, um, we now have about 700 alumni of the program. Our MAP Al Alumni Association is quite strong um, in support um, of our MAP alumni. And they like to say that they support them in putting the A in MAP. They're focused on the application side. We provide the um, education around application and then they support one another around the application side of things. So these are some numbers from our alumni association around what some of our alumni are doing. I'll say that these are actually not recent numbers. Um, it is really hard to keep track um, of so many alumni and the amazing work that they're doing, but many of them continue to flourish in leadership roles. Um, they have um, shared positive psychology with the world through their writing um, in books, uh, in articles, and in peer-reviewed journals um, and other domains as they continue on the research in positive psychology. I mentioned leadership. We have a number of alumni that have actually started regional associations for positive psychology that are subsets under the umbrella of the International Positive Psychology Association. So the International Positive Education Network was actually um, the founding executive director was a MAP alumna. The Positive Education Schools Association, one of the co-founders is an alumna of the program. Same thing for the Canadian Positive Psychology Association, the Chinese Positive Psychology Association, the Colombian Positive Psychology Association, and the Japan Positive Psychology Association. So we have students who come into our classroom who not only are interested in positive psychology and being able to um, translate that into the work that they're doing, but they're also looking at how they can lead the world and pull together a larger community around the world of people who are interested in human flourishing. Some of that is through these associations and some of that of course is through teaching at the university level. We have about 35 MAP alumni um, who are teaching at the university level. Our alumni also share their work with the world through our scholarly commons. So our MAP capstones, um, our students have an opportunity to publish right away on a website that is called scholarly commons, which is um, a public domain that the University of Pennsylvania provides 
um, to translate their research into application and to share it more broadly with the world. This is a recent screenshot of the um, uploads, or I should say downloads, um, that people had done uh, uh, with regard to map capstones from around the world, and you can see the concentrations. So as far as um, New Zealand, uh, far south uh, in the global south is New Zealand, um, and then as far north, um, you can see um, that there are downloads that are occurring in Greenland and even um, or excuse me, um, up in the northern climes of Canada. So uh, an array of different um, people around the world are all interested in positive psychology. And I think that this slide is really emblematic of just how much interest that has garnered. So our alumni come back to us every single year during the MAP Summit. Our third onsite is a summit where we welcome back our MAP alumni. They have an opportunity to present their work and discuss with one another. They also contribute by presenting at conferences around the world. And our most recent um, International Positive Psychology Association World Congress in Vancouver, which was back in July, featured, I want to say, 60 plus MAP alumni um, at various points on the stage or in posters, which was really, really amazing. Okay, so all of that hopefully got you excited about the Master of Applied Positive Psychology program. And now the question might be, how do I bring that to life, right? What does the admissions process look like at MAP? And so, Laura, I'm going to turn things back over to you to take care of that question. Thanks so much, Leona. So if you are now excited and you're really interested in the admissions timeline and process in terms of requirements, here you go. The application deadline is March 1st every year. So for to join the fall of 2024, you want to have that application completed and in by March 1st, 2024. The required materials are detailed on the application overview page of our website. They include a resume, essay, 1,500 words or less, and the questions are four of them that you can integrate into a single document on the website. There are three letters of recommendation that you'll want to have, um, and those should be professional um, professional letters of recommendation, um, basically not your mother. Um, and we know that she probably loves you, but that's probably not the person we want to write your letter of recommendation. Um, all of your transcripts, yes, all of them. Undergraduate, graduate study, many of our applicants come with a variety of degrees and backgrounds. We are going to ask to see all of them. Yes, did you take a summer course um, somewhere in a community college, perhaps between your high school and graduate? Who knows? Yes, those too. So be sure that you are prepared and have those ready to go because that can take a while to gather for some people. The transcripts, um, if you are outside of the United States, they're going to need to be evaluated through either educational perspectives and Certifile, which is the process within the application on our portal, or World Education Services. These are the two evaluative services that enable us to meaningfully compare you across U.S. Um, grade point averages and other things. It's really difficult to do a meaningful comparison without these evaluations. It is required. Please note that it can take some time to put together. <clears throat> so we suggest you allow time for that. The GRE is only applicable if your bachelor's was earned later than spring of 2021. Let me repeat that. The GRE is only applicable if your bachelor's degree was completed later than spring 2021. You can find more information on the website about that. And then we always get um, some questions around the TOEFL or IEL to IELTS score requirement if English is not your native language. Generally, we have a very strict policy about this to ensure that you can be successful in a fast-paced degree um, here in the United States. And so we get requests for waivers all the time. They are rarely granted. You can see the details on our website of exactly what um, that would entail. And we strongly recommend that you take the TOEFL or the IELTS if, you, if English is not your native language because it will complete and strengthen your application for the admissions committee. Thank you for that. All decisions will be released by the end of June, 2024. So that way you can sort of put your application in, go about your life, not stress yourself out and know that you will hear by the end of June, 2024. Um, I know it can be hard to wait. I had that experience myself. So <laughs> your application needs to be marked as complete in the portal in order to enter the review. Now, this is important because maybe you have a letter um, writer who hasn't submitted their letter of recommendation yet. Maybe there's an outstanding transcript. 
in order for it to be in review, it has to be marked as complete. And you can track that. Um, all you have to do is go into the portal and check that out. Um, but you're responsible for monitoring that completion status. And our admissions team will reach out for you if there are outstanding documents. But please pay attention to those emails. They may look automated. They are not. There is a human reviewing each and every application. Um, and so that's really important. And it may be helpful to know that you can submit your application before the deadline. Yeah, even if you're leaning on a letter of recommendation or something that's outside of your control, like a test score, you can still go on and submit that application. And the sooner you submit, the sooner our team is going to be able to start the review process and let you know if all the details are in a row and completed. Um, so that is important information for you if you're going through the process. You may be wondering about scholarships and financial aid for graduate study at the University of Pennsylvania. We have two scholarships um, that you can find information about on our website, the Christopher Peterson Memorial Fellowship and the Beishan Tang. There are also students who have successfully used Fulbright or Rotary um, veteran funding and other things through employer um, benefits or nonprofits who can support educational costs something to be wide and thoughtful about because our students come from so many varied domains of expertise that their access and resources may look different um, individually. I know I was able to find one through a nonprofit who supported performing artists um, transitioning into graduate education. Probably not applicable to everybody, but certainly helps me. Um, so that's something to note. There are also federal loans. Um, if you live in the United States, then you can complete the FAFSA online. You can go in and do that as a part of your application process. And then if you are accepted, they will um, be able to help you move forward. The federal loan has the lowest available rates um, and will offer $20,500 towards your education. The payout is split between the fall and spring semesters, so something to know. If you need additional loans, there are options um, through Student Financial Services called Grad Plus Loans, and you can always talk to Student Registration and Financial Services about that if you are admitted to the program. But I encourage you to start thinking about these costs now as um, you'll notice the Graduate education is a commitment, and it's something that the sooner you get started on to understanding what it is possible for you, the better you will be if you are admitted. Um, and Because that timeline between admission and matriculation can be pretty tight if you don't have a general idea of what you're going to do um, for your financial, financial, for financing your education. So the tuition rates are on our website. Oops, sorry that about should, that. That's okay. That should cover scholarships and financial aid for now. Awesome. And here we are. And here we are. So um, before we go to questions, I wanted to provide this slide to you so that you know where to turn. So we're going to, I'm going to be um, taking the screen share down in just a moment so that we can handle a Q&A and you can see our faces and we can have that conversation. Um, but particularly if you go to penpositivepsych.org, that actually includes all of our educational programs available through the Positive Psychology Center. The map one is the one furthest on the right. And if you um, scroll down to the bottom and click um, learn more, you'll be able to um, find all the details about the Master of Applied Positive Psychology program. As Laura mentioned, we're accepting applications for the fall of 2024. So, you know, we've talked quite a bit about what the MAP classroom is like. You've learned a little bit about our students. You've learned a little bit about our alumni and what they're doing in the world. You've learned a little bit about our faculty. But one of the things that we didn't mention that I want to highlight before we close out today is the extraordinary sense of shared mission that comes mm -hmm. in our classroom. There is such an energy that occurs from people coming together who are like-minded in pursuing and trying to support others in amplifying human flourishing around the world. So it really is this shared vision around making the world a better place to live. Um, and that sense of shared mission between students, faculty, and alumni is extraordinarily powerful in building out the sense of community that we have within the MAP program. So maybe, just maybe, you are the next person who has that shared sense of mission that should be a part of our classroom. And if that is the case, then please listen to Laura's advice and make that application deadline of March 1st so that we can learn a little bit more about you and hopefully welcome you into our classroom too. Um, you'll notice that there is contact information there for Nicole Stottlemyre um, and also an email that you can turn to if you have any questions about the MAP program. So. 
In the meantime, before we turn to that, it is time, I think, for us to take some questions here today. Unfortunately, we have just a little bit of time uh, to be able to do that. So I'm going to reach out to Nicole and Erin and say, are there any questions that have come up during the session that we should be handling here um, in our conversation? So Karen is curious, how uh, do you balance full-time work and the program specifically to uh, you and um, Laura, because you're alumna? You bet. So Laura and I are actually living, breathing examples that it is possible to work full time and to uh, and to go to school full time and still survive it. So um, Laura, I'll share a little bit about my experience and then um, I'll turn things over to you. So for me, yes, I was working full time while I was in MAP. Um, in addition, I was a full time mom to I shouldn't say full time mom, full time family all the time. Right. Um, I was fortunate to have great support from my husband, but my daughter was five at the time when I went through MAP. Um, and it was a lot. I'm going to be very frank, right? There's a lot that you take on when you're doing full-time study. Um, and I'll also say, right, there are very few classes at MAP that you feel as though you're dragging your way through an elective that you have no interest in. One of the nice things about the MAP classroom is that the classes are really exciting. Um, they're interesting. They're around topics that are of fascination to everybody in the classroom. So there's this great energy that occurs in the classroom. And that energy comes not only from the faculty, but from classmates too. There's so much collaborative learning in the classroom and that collaborative energy from your classmates can carry you a long way. For sure, you need to budget your time. You need to be a great time manager. You need to have a lot of support, not only from your employer, but also from your family, um, because you're not gonna be doing perhaps a, a ton of um, additional um, activities, right, uh, during that particular year. But of course, there are seasons in life, right? Um, and so I always say the good news is you get your master's degree in a year. And the bad news is you get your master's degree in a year. So it's intense, um, but it's very, very doable. Um, and like I said, Laura and I are living, breathing uh, examples that you can still be vertical um, when you exit the program. So that's a little bit from my perspective. Laura, I'll um, turn over to you. I would love to echo all of that. Leona has some wonderful um, insights there. I think that's one of the things that surprised me the most um, in juggling that time management perspective was how energizing I really felt the work was in MAP um, because the assignments are both going to take you from a reading perspective and theoretical spectrum, but also this application perspective. I found that doing the applied assignments and the experiential assignments in particular helped to buoy my energy. So I would look at what assignment was in front of me and I would budget that time specifically to maybe a time when I needed a boost um, in my day. And the Focused reading time was a time when my, I knew that my mental bandwidth would be able to focus um, and that had higher energy naturally. So looking at the how and when you budget that time can make a difference um, in your experience in MAP. And we've also got some wonderful support in our assistant instructors who are other uh, examples besides Leona and I that would support you and say, yes, you too can do it. I have done it too. Um, in addition, one happens to be a productivity expert and consultant that have offers a, um, some information to our students each year on what are some productive strategies? We've also got some other resources at the University of Pennsylvania that can help you with time management. If that's something that you don't feel as strong in prior to coming into MAP, let me tell you, you will know those skills after MAP. Um, when I graduated and suddenly didn't have that 20 to 25 hours a week, I was like, what do I do with myself? I have all this extra time. <laughs> so um, there's something that you learn um, as part of the program as well. And I as Leona said, it is not easy, but it if it's something that lights you up and is the reason you're here and is the reason you think you want to be applying, then I would encourage you not to let it be a barrier. Um, if you can reasonably dedicate that 20 to 25 hours a week by asking for support from either your family or employer or looking at your schedule meaningfully around that. Awesome. Great. Um, there are a couple of questions about what people are doing after MAP. Um, Christina and Libby both asked about, um, well, is there a PhD in positive psych at Penn, but also going on to PhDs more generally? Um, and then the other question from Ermin, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, is um, are most people pivoting careers as a result of MAP or primarily continuing in their field? And that received a few upvotes, so I think others are interested in hearing about that. 
Awesome, great. Okay, so um, in answer to the PhD question, we have about um, 5% of our classroom, I guess I would say, um, who are interested in pursuing a PhD after, um, after MAP. We don't have a PhD in positive psychology at Penn. Um, there is one that's available at Claremont Graduate University. We have had a subset of our classroom that have gone on to graduate study uh, here at the University of Pennsylvania um, in the psychology department and gotten their PhDs in psychology. So um, typically moving on to a PhD requires a research master's, right, to underpin it. So our program is specifically a professional master's. So it's geared toward, um, it's kind of like, um, think about like the MBA, right, of a, of a psychology program. It's focused on application and actually um, executing something different in the world as a result of the education that you're engaged in. Um, and as I said, right, there's a small subset and they would want to make sure that their capstone um, would be an empirical capstone where they're doing some research if they wanted to exit the program and proceed on to doctoral study from there. Laura, is there anything else you would add to that related to the PhD concept? Just that if that is you, identify yourself early in the process to your assistant instructors and our MAP team so that we can help support and facilitate that across the year because the timeline for the capstone will look different if you are trying to go through IRB review for empirical research. Um, and lastly, I'll just say is that most of our alumni who are in that subset doing PhDs are looking um, in psychology, but some are also looking at PhDs in organizational scholarship, positive organizational scholarship. Um, we've had a few go through University of Michigan as well. So that's the other one I would potentially highlight. You bet, you bet. Um, okay, um, and so um, Erman, you're um, curious to know how many, and apologies if we're uh, mispronouncing your name, curious to know how many participants have pivoted their career as a result of taking MAP, or do they primarily continue in their field? So um, the, the idea of a pivot, right, is an interesting framing of this. So we've done some research amongst our alumni to say how many people have made advancements in their field, right? Have you gotten a... Um, have you gotten a promotion, a career advancement? Are you doing something different? There are pivots that can occur within fields. So for instance, um, we have some attorneys that have now pivoted um, and are still working in the law field, but they're not practicing law anymore. They're working on advancing well-being amongst attorneys in the field. So they're still in the same field. So I wouldn't say it's entirely a career pivot, but the work that they're doing in that field has changed substantively to focus on the integration of human flourishing into their work. I'm specifically thinking about one of our um, MAP alumna um, who um, actually works with the Utah State Bar Association as well as the Utah Supreme Court, and they have advanced a major well-being initiative in the state of Utah related to attorney well-being. Um, we've got, um, similarly, um, we have a... Um, a number of, um, for instance, physicians, right, that have come through the MAP program um, that are still working in medicine and, right, they have also um, integrated um, some of the work that they're doing around flourishing for either the uh, individuals that they're working directly with, um, I'm thinking of one person particularly uh, who's at Cincinnati and works in a pediatric uh, OR. Um, and so working with um, ensuring a flourishing and productive um, team in that community, but she is still a practicing pediatric um, cardiac anesthesiologist. So, um, so it's like a both and, right? It's like there's a small pivot within um, I will say there's also there are also some people who within their careers transition over to consulting or coaching, right? Um, and but they continue tech, to, um, typically to focus on the people with whom they have, are most closely associated and with whom they have um, the greatest knowledge around. So somebody um, we had a, a former Teach for America teacher um, who did a um, some qualitative work in partnership with a MAP alumni alumna for um, her work for her capstone. Um, that capstone has blossomed into a, a, a huge consulting and coaching business that is now focused on supporting high performers, um, especially in um, highly stressed urban and um, educational environments. So. Um, so she's still working in education, even though um, she's done a pivot and she's actually operating a business now that serves that community. Um, so that gives those are a couple of ideas from my perspective. Laura, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are with regard to that. I think we want MAP 
to shift your perspective, right? Anytime you're coming into an educational degree, we hope that you're learning things, my goodness, and it is an applied degree. So we hope that that application would adjust your perspective and your work in some way. That can look like changing how you handle your team in a team meeting. Um, um, if you're already in a position, it doesn't necessarily mean you change positions. Um, and it may. Some people do change positions. Some people do change um, how they're working within their populations. The thing I want to underscore here is that MAP is going to provide you high quality education in positive psychology. It is not how to be an entrepreneur. It is not a coaching certificate. It is not learning to be an HR. I don't know, right? It is high quality education in positive psychology, which is broadly applicable across a variety of domains, but may not be sufficient for whatever dream or pivot you are also looking for. So think about like, what is the hope? Who do you want to serve? What is the vision? That's the vision we're going to ask you for in your application. And if that vision is served by the expertise that you already have in your domain of expertise and depth and rigor and positive psychology, you're going to be very well positioned um, at the end of the at the end of the program to make those changes and pivots. And if there are other gaps, there may be other things you need to learn as well. Um, so that's there are many ways to learn and many ways to bring our lives and our hopes and dreams into fruition. And I hope that this is a step that lights you up. Um, but knowing what we are and what we aren't can sometimes be clarifying in that process. Wonderful. Wonderful. So um, at this point, I'm taking a look at the clock and I recognize that we are at a little over the 60 minute mark. Um, and so I think what we will do is we will bring a close to this session for those people who need to exit um, and we'll um, close off the recording. We can hang around for an additional couple minutes for those of you who may have some additional time and may have some additional questions. So on um on behalf of myself, but also our team, I want to um, just extend a warm thank you first to Laura Taylor for the energy um, and excitement um, that she brings to this as a real wealth of information um, that could support students who are transitioning into this role. I want to thank Nicole and Erin, who are our fearless team that have been probably typing frantically this whole time, trying to answer as many questions as they can uh, as they've been handling that Q&A and um, handling all of your questions as well as they can. They are amazing resources to all of you who are interested in applying to the um, applying to the Master of Applied Positive Psychology program. Um, to our friend Akila, who's been producing this session for us. Akila, we're hoping that you're feeling better um, and thank you for struggling through to be with us here today. The final thank you I want to extend is to all of you, right? All of our time is precious, right? Our, our Probably our most precious commodity anymore is our time as there are demands constantly for time and attention. And I recognize all of you have contributed your time to us here today uh, in order to learn more about the Master of Applied Positive Psychology program. It is a program that we love. We are in it every day. We eat, breathe, and sleep map. Uh, we are we you know love our students. We love our alumni. Um, we love the community as they come together. Um, and hopefully, we've translated some of that love over to you, and you are getting an idea of what it's like to be a student or to be an alum of the Master of Applied Positive Psychology program. So, as a reminder, that deadline is March first. Perhaps, perhaps you are the next person who is interested in changing the lives of the people with whom you work and helping them to live more um, flourishing and productive and happy lives. And if that is the case, we would welcome you joining us in our classroom in order to learn not only with you, but from you as you are translating some of that work into the world that you serve. So thank you all for being here. Um, it has been a joy to be with you. Um, we will look forward to connecting with you again in the future. And at this point, we will shut down the recording. Um, and as I said, farewell to those of you who need to leave. It has been a joy to have you here with us. If you would like to stay and ask a few more questions, we welcome you doing that. Take care, everyone.